What's up, everybody? How is everyone doing tonight? Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, like I said, like the title says, we're going to be talking about the Trinity and the logical problem and if it actually works, right? People go, hey, you believe in three gods. What what do you actually believe in? And a lot of us, we got these crazy metaphors uh, like the egg analogy, the water, ice, and vapor. All, all of those are nonsense. Just throw those out. Um, we're going to try to get down to the brass tacks of what that actually is. And uh, we've been so blessed to get a guest. We got our uh, our friend here, Inspiring Mike from Inspiring Philosophy, joining us, which your camera is now not all of a sudden showing up. Give me two seconds to fix. What'd you do? I, I messed it up, man. I messed it up. At least we got your audio going. That's all that counts. Hold on, hold on. There I see go. me. There you go. Now, there. I, now I got you, but now I got you like... Oh, no. That's too big. <laughs> Oh, what are you, oh, this man, is, you this is the, it. listen, this is, it's a trope <laughs> here. If there's not a mechanical issue on my live, then it's not my live. There's always some oh, sort of mechanical issue. And if just, it's not, it's, it's just part of my charm now, but you it, just hey, got to switch the stream yard. It's I just know. so, I know I'm cheap. That's my issue. I'm just too cheap with it. So, Hey man, thanks for joining and thanks for doing this. Uh, I had questions cause basically, uh, long story short is I, uh, I was watching Parker on his live and then Danny jumped in and they were having a conversation and basically they went into this whole thing about, you know, they they had a debate with you and they were calling you out and they were doing all that on there. And I was like, what what the heck are they talking about? And yeah, uh, it's, a, yeah. So it's a public spectacle. That. It's a public spectacle. They're not interested in debate. This is just it's like a sports competition. Uh, it's let's just just, let's just talk smack. Let's throw these st stuff around. They're not interested in having a real conversation. This is about just trying to hype up your side, hype up your tribe, make it all about us versus them, tacking the person, not the idea. I mean, and that kind of stuff, that's immaturity. I'm going to ignore it like a normal person would. I'm going to be interested in having debates with like honest people that want to have respectful conversations, not try to trap you, not make it personal. And they're not interested in that. So neither I'm not interested in talking with them. I'm going to move on and do actual things that are going to be meaningful. So what exactly happened? Like you were, you were just hosting your <laughs> live and then he just jumped in and started talking to you or like, what, what, well, what went down? Know, I didn't even know who he was until he was in the room. Um, and after someone was talking to me about it and said like, what he likes to do is go in and like surprise and try to trap people. Um, and then, you know, claim he like beat him in a debate kind of thing. So I was like, well, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to deal with this guy anymore. Um, but he comes into the room and he's trying to throw out this uh, logical problem of the Trinity issue. Uh, you know, if Jesus is equal to God and God is equal to the father, then why aren't the father and Jesus equal? And I was trying to explain to him that this understanding of identity just doesn't work in philosophy of mind. And he wouldn't really let me get my uh, position out. Uh, and so at the end, he basically said, well, you know, my argument only works in classical logic. And I was like, well, I've not really looked into this while I kept saying quine when I meant to say clean, but I'm a, I wanted to point out, uh, I hold to a three valued logic system. So I don't really hold to classical logic. I hold to a three valued. Uh, and so he was like, well, then my objection doesn't work. I'm like, yeah. And then he left. And then after he claimed some sort of victory and I was like, like, Dude, like, first of all, that's not a victory if you admit your entire objection doesn't work on my view. And right. also, the only way you're claiming victories is if you is that you brought up something I wasn't prepared to go over. And I kept saying, like, quine instead of clean. But this is what happens when you speak off the cuff. It's not. And that's why if you're going to have an actual debate, have an actual debate where we have time to prepare. Because you take that, you upload it, you claim victory, and you just confuse the audience because – Neither of us have time to really prepare our position and give the audience something meaningful they can look at. But that's what those people aren't really interested in. They're just interested in scoring points. So, you know, and that's it is what it is. And that's exactly what happened, yeah, man, because, because I got confused and other people got confused. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I went and watched it and, and it seemed like what you were saying was making sense to me. And it seemed like what he was saying was kind of making sense to me, even though like I'm an idiot when it comes <laughs> to this kind of stuff. Uh, but then I like started talking to some friends about it and they're like, uh, they were saying something along the lines of like, you didn't defend it right. And you didn't talk about the counting method properly. And so that's one thing I want to touch on first is, well, what, what is that counting to be fair, method? Just to cover really quick again, I didn't really have a lot of time to, ex to elaborate on my position. Yeah. Uh, and again, it's, as you said, when you take that kind of thing, when you someone's speaking off the cup and you upload a natural debate, 
you're not interested in having meaningful conversations for your audience. You're interested in trying to score points and attack the person and try to make them look bad, uh, which again shows that this is just, you're not interested in, in actually putting something out there. If it's going to make confusion, like, again, I kept saying quine when I meant to say clean, because I hadn't looked at classical logic versus non-classical logic for a while. Uh, so, you know, it was just, it wasn't fresh in my brain. Uh, but with, with the counting, again, his basic argument was, is that, uh, you know, it's the whole, it goes back to the basic understanding of the Trinity. How can one plus one plus one equal one? Should be, shouldn't it be three gods? And the argument, again, as I said, is like, if Jesus is equal to, the, to God and God is equal to the Father, how are Jesus and the Father not equal? If A is equal to B and B is equal to C, how are A and C not equal? And what I was trying to explain is that that, that just simply doesn't work through numerous examples. So you just can't make that kind of assumption when we can find examples where that just simply doesn't work. It also depends how we're defining person and being. How are we defining agency? Um, are we going to use something like trope, for example, uh, or aspect, you know, terms that, you know, like theologians like Joshua Sidiwati are going to use. And then when you get into that, I mean, the understanding of identity is going to be much broader. You, you just can't reduce any everything to these simple rules. Because when we get deep into philosophy surrounding the Trinity or just philosophy of mind, these concepts just simply don't work all the time. So the the logic that he was using, um, like I said, I, I, talk to me like I'm a five-year-old, like I'm an idiot to this stuff because because I am, <laughs> is classical logic. Is, is that right? Yeah. So classical logic is uh, just the basic uh, you know understanding of most people have when it comes to logic. But there's a lot of problems with classical logic. Uh, so like, well, before you get into the problems of that, can just for the sake of the audience and myself, can you like sum up what is classical logic and where we would use it? Yeah, I mean, classical logic is going to be the, the best way I can sort of summarize it is like you're going to get your three laws of laws, like law of identity, law of non-contradiction, law of excluded middle, that kind of thing. Uh, it's going to be a very simple, basic understanding of like laws of logic, I guess would be the best way to say it. Mm -hmm. Now, these things could get very complicated when you get deep into like what logicians are going over, uh, like looking at things like the principle of explosion, the paradox of material implications, these kinds of things. I don't really want to go into that because mm -hmm. it's hard to explain. <laughs> sure. Um, it's like one of those things you kind of read and go, oh, okay, I kind of get it. but well, I don't know how to explain this to other people. Right. So like it, it goes a lot deeper than just the, the, the foundation, those three rules. But when he's using oh, this yeah. like counting method, he's basically sticking to this whole idea of like classical. And, it, and, and when he's like looking at that, that's – if you're looking at the Trinity, would you say that that holds to like classical logic? Or would you say that you can give an explanation that with the Trinity that holds to a lot, uh, classical logic? Well, I think you can. Um, I what I was trying to make the point is, is if you're going to have this very strict rule of identity, which a lot of logicians are just going to reject, then yeah, it would mean the Trinity is illogical, but we can just reject that rule because it's not, it's not foundational. It, it's quite debated. I mean, it's like, you just can't, if you just look at like papers, like, you know, like um, Joshua Sidiwati's work, for example, or uh, Bo Branson, another one, uh, you're going to see, there's a lot more complexity to these kinds of issues that just simply cannot be reduced to all of these very simple notions. It's like trying to understand the world around us through just Aristotelian physics. Uh, you might say, well, that's a very simple understanding of the world, and I would agree, but it doesn't explain everything. So we just can't take very outdated physics and say, yeah, we'll just use this because it's simple. No, when we look at reality, we find numerous aspects that just aren't going to align with Aristotelian physics. And if that's the case, okay, then we need a much more broader understanding of physics. It's kind of the same way with book, uh, basically classical logic. Uh, sure, it's a very simple place to start from, but when we get into the nitty gritty, when we start studying philosophy of mind, quantum mechanics, we're and just logic in general, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like even reading some of Kurt Gödel's stuff, you're going to see these laws just cannot simply work all the time. Uh, they're, they're good approximations, but we need a broader understanding of logic to account for this. This is why I hold to a three-valued logic system. I just don't think, uh, like, for example, when it comes to the law of excluded middle, that that can really hold in every single instance. So, wow. Like, okay, hold on. Let me let me take that in for a second. So okay. is classical logic 
something that we can use on a day-to-day -day basis or do you throw it out the window completely and hold to an entirely different type of logic? I would say classical, I would say things like this, compared to like Newtonian physics and like uh, Einstein's understanding of general relativity. Okay. So like we're going to talk about gravitational pull, like gravity is going to like pull you down to the earth. We're going to use that in common language. But we now know that there is no such thing as gravitational pull. It's the space curvature pushing things down to the earth. We can use Newtonian physics as a good approximation for everyday life, even though we understand the way the world really works is going to be the you know quantum physics and general relativity. Uh, and there's probably even deeper theory than that. Same with you know basic classical logic. We can use that, but there's going to be problems where we're going to come across certain examples where like the law of excluded middle is not going to hold. If you hold to, for example, paraconsistent logic, you're going to deny the law of non-contradiction. Uh, intuitionist logic is going to uh, deny the rule, uh, that, uh, an idea in, in classical logic that double negation leads to a positive. They're going to argue that no, it doesn't. Uh, so uh, classical logic is a good way to operate in just the macro world we live mm -hmm. in. It's an approximation of things, but it's not going to be, it's not going to cover all of reality. It's not going to cover all of what we understand in logic. Could you give me something where, like an example, like a very simple one where classical logic doesn't work? Yeah, this is an argument I actually saw Carnades.org use. So premise one, assume that the laws of logic are true. Premise two, all propositions are either true or false. Premise three, the proposition, this proposition is false, is neither true nor false. Premise four, there exists at least one proposition that is neither true nor false. Premise five, it is not the case that all propositions are either true or false. Premise six, it both is and is not the case that all pro propositions are either true or false. Conclusion, therefore, the laws of logic are not true. Now, that only really works if you accept like classical logic, like the law of excluded middle. If you take a three-valued logic system, you avoid this argument all altogether because it's all premised on the idea, the proposition, this proposition is false, can neither be said to be true or false. So it's got to be something other, like a third category in and of itself. You really know how to make a guy feel dumb. Uh, so no, you got it. You got it. Just, I'm gonna again, have to rewatch. I don't, that. I don't want to spend too much time talking yeah, about yeah. this because again, this can get very complex. Deep. I mean, like if you go into like Girdle, for example, he shows like that, and sometimes in mathematics, a double negation has to mean a negative. Right. A negative. It can't mean a positive. So this is a problem for classical logic. I mean, there's that. There's like as I mentioned, the paradox of material implications. Again, a lot of this stuff is very complex. I don't even fully know if i can explain it all yeah, yeah. well but like my whole philosophy around this is is like we don't need to really talk about this let's talk about uh looking at reality and seeing the way lo like reality works and then trying to understand logic from our understanding of reality like we should use our understanding of logic to help us understand reality but then reality should in turn help us understand logic and so this is the point I was trying to make. So, yeah, and that makes sense. So basically, if I was to kind of like uh, bring that down a little bit, what you're saying is we shouldn't presuppose the laws of logic are true and apply them to the world because then if something happens in the world, it kind of crushes our foundation. Instead, we should look at the world and try to build our logic off of that. Is, is that what you're saying? Yeah, kind of. I mean, I would probably say we can start with the assumption the laws of logic are true. But if sure. we go out into reality and we start saying, well, you know, it doesn't work in quantum mechanics, it doesn't really work in philosophy of mind. Um, maybe these are uh, more, we should think of these more as like approximations for how we understand and go through life. But there are going to be instances where logic seems to be, needs to be expanded upon, I guess. And this is where non-classical logic comes in, whether we're going to take, you know, a three value logic system, a many value logic system, intuitionist logic, paraconsistent logic, Quantum logic, which is something altogether not really even inconsistent with classical logic, but that's a whole other story. I mean, again, very complex. <laughs> sure. So if classical logic isn't the only way to hold this, um, I, I, I one of the questions I wanted to ask is what types of logic are there? But I'm guessing there's a lot to go through. So what do you... <laughs> What do you hold to? Like, like when somebody asks you, hey, you know, what foundation of logic do you hold to? What, what's the answer you give? Uh, three valued logic system. So propositions could be either true or false or, or something else. It's, 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 it's saying there's, there's vague boundaries in between these types of things. There's vague boundaries in between identity uh, or, you know, true and false statements. Uh, so we, we basically reject the de uh, determinant uh, 
of certain properties. Uh, it's hard to really say sometimes that we can't really put strict border lines on things. Uh, okay. So that's kind of the way to look at it. And again, not everything's going to be true or false. That's just uh, um, an idea of three value logic system. So can you give me, can you give me like a rough example of like, um, you know, some premises that you'd bring forth with a three valued logic system? Well, I, I did earlier. I mentioned that. That's argument, the same thing. Uh, same kind of idea. Yeah, yeah okay. that's what I was sort of getting at. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah. so how does that now start applying to the Trinity, right? Because if you're saying that the Trinity doesn't fully hold to classical logic, from your point, if we're using this three-valued logical system, how will we apply it? And how, how will we give it on a pop level, I guess? Like, how, how is someone like well, me going to give that to like your average person? Well, let's, let's, let's move away from just talking about logic itself. Like I said, let's just start talking about... Uh, what we experience in reality and okay. then just sort of working from there. Uh, because again, if we're going to talk about this on a pop level, uh, it's better to actually just talk about the Trinity itself, talk about minds, talk about things that people actually understand. And I think that'd be a much better a way to approach this for the audience. Because again, that's what I think is more important. I don't want to go into these different systems, which again, I, I'm not even sure if I can fully explain them because again, it gets really complex, but let's just talk about the Trinity. Okay. How can one being be three persons. Well, we need to start talking about uh, agency in of itself. But before I do that, I want to preface this kind of basic idea. I don't think the Trinity is illogical. I think it's just incomprehensible to the human mind. And that should make sense to us because, for example, um, the physicist Stephen Barr wrote a book called My, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, Modern Cosm, like, it's like, like I forget now that it's break. I'll remember here in a second, but um, basically he points out in the book that um, uh, you can have universes with multiple spatial dimensions. Like you can basically have, you know, a, a, a universe with like four dimensions or five dimensions. The book is modern physics and ancient faith. That's the Stephen Barr's book. Uh, so you can have a universe with like four or five spatial dimensions. Now I can't even picture that. I don't know what that would look like. But then Barr goes one step further and he says, but you could also have a universe. It's entirely logically, perfectly normal in logic, uh, in mathematics, to have a universe with multiple dimensions of time. Now, I have a hard time picturing what it would be like to be in four dimensions of space, let alone two dimensions of time. It's incomprehensible. But according Wait. to the mathematics, it's completely logical. So does that throw away like A, A, A theory and B theory into like whole different types of two theories of time? Or is it still within those two? It would still be something. I mean, those are different theories of how to understand our time. But okay. this would be saying there could be, you know, two B or A theories of time, I guess you could say. Uh, so it's completely logical from our understanding of mathematics. It's just incomprehensible. I would say the same thing when it comes to the Trinity. So... We need to start by understanding uh, what we mean by an agent. So how would you define an agent? Um, so usually when it's asked towards me, I'd say, I think, therefore, I am. That's how I would mm -hmm. define that, an agent. Yeah. yeah. Marcus Schlozer says in very general terms, an agent is a being with the capacity to act. An agency denotes the exercise or manifestation of this capacity. Very simple understanding of agency. You act. You do things. You decide between different desires in your head, different dispositions, different ideas. This, this is you being an agent. However, there's another way to understand agency. So for example, Alfred Mele says, you know, like we decide between different desires, but no desire floats free in a desi desiring being. So your desires are still part of you, mm -hmm. even though you as an agent decide between them, right? Right. Right. So... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so with Daniel Dennett's, well, let me, so before I quote Daniel Dennett, let me say this, like, there's another way to view your agency. You have that narrow sense that decides between different as different um, desires you may have. And then there's the broad sense that would include all of your goals, your dispositions, your desires, your dreams, your thoughts, your emotions. All of that is still you in some other sense, some other aspect. As Daniel Dennett says, I've created it and, and unleashed an agent who is myself. If it acts to produce harm, the manufacturer is held responsible. So think of it like this. If I'm, I don't have to consciously decide when I'm driving my car to push the pedal and turn the wheel. I just do that automatically. But if I get in a car accident, I can't be like, well, you see officer, I didn't actively consciously push the pedal and ram into that guy. I was daydreaming. It was, it was just my, um, my uh, brain running on autopilot. 
uh, he's going to look at me like I'm crazy and say, no, you're still responsible. So is it, are you basically so, saying conscious and subconscious or am I missing something here? Like, is there our subconscious well, thought bringing the thoughts to us and how we interact with them or no? Not really. Okay. I mean, think of like all of your desires, all of your dispositions, right. all of your goals, your dreams, all of that is you in, in a broad sense, right? Like you're not divorced from your goals, even though you can decide between different goals. Mm -hmm. You're not divorced from your desires, even though you can decide between different desires. There is a like a little man in a machine that you would consider yourself as the conscious agent. But then there's that broad sense as then it says, I've created and unleashed an agent, this broad aspect of myself uh, that sort of uh, can do things that I'm still responsible for. So you can understand your agency in two ways, two aspects. You have that narrow sense, but you have that broad sense. So right then and there, you're just one agent, right? But you can understand your agency in two different ways, right? Yeah. It's not just, you know, it's not just as simple as we think our agency is. It can get much more complex. The broad sense of myself can do things that I am responsible for, but I also have in my narrow sense to sort of act in certain ways to maybe go against uh, the way my broad self wants to go. Like, let's say, for example, I've spent a lifetime eating junk food and I've just developed these dispositions to just eat junk food constantly. And then one day I decide, no, I want to start eating healthier. I want to exercise. I want to get my body under control. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to have these very strong desires that I've spent a lifetime building up, pulling me in the direction of wanting to eat junk food. Uh, but I am also going to make conscious decisions to maybe want to exercise or eat healthy you can see this kind of aspect of these different aspects of our agency pulling us in different directions. Okay. We're two in one in a sense. Yeah. That, I, I, I think I know what you're saying. So basically we like, um, you know, it's that, it's that kind of like dumb metaphor of like the two wolves, which one you feed. you know, that metaphor I'm talking about. Kind of like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have like I these say, desires and go ahead. Yeah. I would say it's like that, but just we're adding a little bit more complexity. That's yeah. It's going to more align with philosophy of mind. Right. Yeah. So that makes sense. And so this kind of shows you wouldn't say that you have two agents, even though there's two aspects of what's going on in your head. Um, you would say you have a singular agent. So is that kind of moving now towards the Trinity? Like, are you saying that God is a mind or are we, are my well, God is steps? a mind. God is a mind. I mean, like, this is my problem with like comparing the Trinity to an egg or a three leaf clover. I mean, because God isn't a physical thing. He's a mind. <laughs> we need to compare him to other minds and if we're going to make an analogy to the Trinity, we need to compare them to a mind. And so that, that's an important thing to do when we're talking about the Trinity. Stop comparing them to water or sun or a, a three-leaf clover. I mean, that, that's just not a good way to explain the Trinity. So if we can see ourselves as a broad sense of agency and a narrow sense of agency, my basic argument would be is that God, who's three in one, is three narrow senses of agency and a broad sense of agency. So he's three persons of one mind. Okay. So then why am I not two persons? Because as I said, you're not, uh, you wouldn't look at yourself as three narrow senses in a broad sense. You look at yourself as one narrow sense uh, of your own agency in your broad sense of agency. So God is basically would be three persons. So Joshua Sijawati, he says, what makes a person, let me just quote him directly. Sure. He says, what makes an entity of the primary kind person is to have a first person perspective, essentially to be a person, whether a divine person, an angel, a human person, or a Martian person, one would have a first person perspective. So you in that narrow sense of agency, you have that first person perspective, uh, your broad sense of agency doesn't really have that first person perspective in that in that same kind of sense that you have in the narrow sense, even though it still is you as an agent. So God would be three first person perspectives, three narrow senses of agency, three persons in that whole mind of what we would call God. And that would be the Trinity. Now, each of them is fully God because just like you are fully your broad sense of agency and your narrow sense of agency, each member of the Trinity is each narrow sense of their self of their first person perspective. Plus they are also the broad sense of agency in that they are God. So each of them is fully God, just like we are fully our broad sense of agency in our narrow sense of agency. So is there multiple agencies here? Like, do we have like a, a grand agency that is God? And then the three persons, father, son, Holy spirit, they all have independent agency. 
Well, we wouldn't say that God as a whole has an independent agency because that would be a fourth member of the Trinity. Right. Remember, there are three. God, Father, or sorry, Father, Son, and Spirit. So, again, each one would have a first-person perspective. They're each an agent, as I'm defining it. Uh, they're each a person, as Joshua Sejuani defines. Right. So, they're agent person. Then within, but they are all God. So, they are all equally the broad sense of agency in that understanding because they all have access to the divine mind and that kind of, it, it, so to speak, I guess would be a way to put it. Uh, just like you, again, are your narrow and your broad sense. There's no like uh, in between. There's no like able to separate yourself in the two. You are both simultaneously. You are two in one. Likewise, the son and the spirit, the son, for example, is fully God, fully the broad sense of agency. And you are the um, narrow sense as well. The, the broad sense is not what I meant when I was talking about that first person experience kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so, so I uh, hope that makes sense. Cause maybe I was un unclear on that. It, it does. It does make sense. But uh, like initial issue that I have is, is that broad sense of agency then is that guided like, or is it kind of acting independently? Like who would be in control of that broad sense of agency? How would that work? Well, the three persons of the Trinity would all be God and they would all have access to this, what we would call mind. In that kind of sense. Now, if we get more specific in the different models of the Trinity, I would say, because I'm a monarchical Trinitarian, I would right. say the Father is the head. So he's ultimately going to be the one who's going to be uh, uh, numerically God. And then the Son and the Spirit are God in a predicative sense. So that's just getting into different models of the Trinity. I'm trying to keep it very general for right now, just to sort of understand the basic understanding of what I mean when we say that how can God be three in one? Well, again, it's God, there'd be three first person perspectives, three narrow senses of agency within this broad sense. And when you take, for example, the spirit, for example, uh, there's not going to be any part where he is the uh, a portion of just the broad sense of agency. He has access to the full divine mind. Mm -hmm. So he is in that sense, the Holy Spirit, but he is also fully God, just like you are fully your narrow sense of agency and fully your broad sense of agency. The son is fully the son but also fully the broad sense of agency and that he is fully God, that kind of thing. Now with, with like my broad sense of agency, I know uh, there's a big argument of determinism right there. So for example, if a snake strikes at me, I usually react before my brain actually registers what's going on. Is, would that be the same case with God then? Are we saying that there's a cause and effect in God? Like that to me wouldn't make any sense. Well, I think we're, we're we're taking the analogy too far than to what it's supposed to go okay. because we're we're trying to say that somehow God is like determined by things. Um, no, we're just talking basically about agency. God would okay. be far above beyond you know the, these kinds of influences, I guess you could say. Uh, but again, God is still going to be. I mean, William Lane Craig says God is uh, going to do what His nature has Him do. God is one with His nature. So, you know, we ground, you know, example, object, objective moral values and duties in God's nature. God's not going to do anything that goes against his nature. We wouldn't say that God is determined because God is his nature. He is one with his nature. Uh, and so it's just that broad sense of understanding uh, helps us understand how God can be three narrow senses or three persons in one mind. So we're not doing like a direct comparison. Like I have two agencies in my head and this is how I think. And therefore if God has these three agencies and therefore he must think like this. We're not doing that. We're just simply showing this is how agency works. This is how you can relate to it in your own mind. And then God has this different nature that's outside of our own mind, but that is three agencies that kind of share in this collective, not a fourth, but like those three agencies make up the collective of the overall arching big agency. Am I, am I getting this or am I missing it? No, yeah, you're getting it. Um, let's use another analogy to help. Okay. It. So I use this analogy often and Muslims hate it. That's why I keep using it because um, it, it gets right to the point here. The show Moon Knight in the show, he's set up as someone who's supposed to have multiple personality disorder, but he doesn't really have that. Because someone with that disorder would have would be one conscious agent, and they switch between different alters, different personalities. Uh, they don't coexist. Uh, they're never like talking to each other. Like you're not going to see like you know one controlling just the arm, and then the other one controlling the other arm. That just right. doesn't happen. Uh, there were some alleged cases of that in the 1800s, but they just never showed up, other than just like these weird reports that were never verified. Um, so. That's the issue there. But in the show, Moon Knight is three persons that coexist. They talk to each other. They all share in the essence of Moon Knight, the being of Moon Knight. They all have access to that power. 
But Mark is not Stephen. Stephen is not Jake. Jake is not Mark. There are three persons in this in this guy. Uh, but each of them are fully Moon Knight, but each of them are not the, each other. So each is fully Moon Knight, but each is not the other. So when people say, how can three be one that doesn't make sense? Well, we have an entire show around that very concept of how one being can be three persons. Uh, each one is fully a person, like they are, they have, they're fully a person, uh, but they are all one, of one being, namely that of Moon Knight. So within that show, we can see a perfect analogy for the Trinity. Now, it's, it's an analogy, so obviously, like, we're talking about a created being that exists in time. It's not going to perfectly represent God, but it does represent how a being could be three in one. It's not hard to imagine. It happens right in a show. I can I can hear the Muslims right now saying this guy said that God has multiple personality <laughs> disorder. I you can, see, I, I can. You hear see it. what he said? Oh, they already have. They already have because <laughs> instead of actually trying to understand what we're we're talking about, they have a straw man. And so I laugh because they just make fun of it. But I mean, all they can do is either dismiss it or make fun of it. So it tells me it's a good analogy. Okay, and uh, so I'll, I'll kind of jump on this. Um, don't don't we kind of end up with like those three persons? That, that are in, you know, what's his name's head from Moon Knight. Would you would you use the counting method with them if we were to like hold that viewpoint from a natural like if we're not looking at God and we're just looking at the character in Moon Knight, would we use the counting method there and would it work? No, it wouldn't. That was my that's my basic point when using that analogy. The counting method just simply does not work there. Uh because again, each one is fully Moon Knight, but each person is not each other. I mean Mark is not Steven. Steven is not Mark. Uh, but they are both fully Moon Knight, uh, and so you know, and they're all. It's this is one being. There's one Moon Knight. There's not three Moon Knights. There's one Moon Knight because uh, when Mark is uh, acting as Moon Knight, Stephen cannot uh, come out and like you know take control of the physical body because Mark is in control. So there's one Moon Knight, but there's three persons. Is the point? And so within that analogy, uh, we can fully see how you can have a being who is three persons. So you have in Moon Knight, again, you have three narrow senses of agency in this broad sense of agency. They are Moon Knight. You can understand it's a whole broad sense. The whole mm -hmm. powers of Moon Knight is that whole broad sense. But in there, you have three persons or three agents. You know, as soon as you use the Moon Knight analogy, it, I think it finally clicked. I think I finally got it. Um, <laughs> that's so, why I use it. It's, hey, it's perfect. That's good. I like it. So if somebody comes to you, like, because in all honesty, the way today's the world's going, James White made this point. Uh, that the average Christian can't just get off, get away with saying, you know, God loves you and I felt his presence and, you know, we have to study and we have to be more knowledgeable because people are getting access to YouTube, they're getting access to podcasts, they're getting more information and they're learning about these logical problems. So if somebody comes to them with the logical problem of the Trinity, what would be your, your like your best way to kind of like shut that down and give them a good explanation without going to like these deep philosophical problems? Well, I mean, I would I would do the first thing I said, or one of the earlier things I said, which is, um, look, there are entire Stephen Barr notes. There's entire universes. It's entirely mathematically, logically possible for a universe to have multiple time dimensions. Now, I can't comprehend that, but it doesn't mean it's illogical. So maybe the Trinity isn't illogical. It's just incomprehensible. Would we agree on that? Uh, let Let's start there. So. Then I would go to the Moon Knight analogy. Look, here's a perfect example of how a being can be three persons. One being three persons, right there. If there's an entire show built around this concept, obviously it's not in a logical concept for a, a being to be three persons. Uh, you know, and then, you know, I would start, if, if that doesn't work, I start going into philosophy of mind, uh, talking about the understanding of agency. So let, let, let me bring up this. Like Muslims always say, well, why was Jesus talking to himself? If, if you know, if God is, if, if Jesus is God, was he talking to himself? No, he was talking to the Father. Well, it's one being, right? It's one God. Look, if you ever had a dream, and in your dream, did you talk to somebody in your dream? Like I had a dream one night. Last night I was talking to people. Uh, I was on some sort of island or something. I don't want to go into the beer. <laughs> no, come on. I, come I, on, I share dream. the dream. Get, get all the details. All right, go <laughs> I ahead. don't really remember, but I know I was talking to people in the dream. Who was I talking to? Me. I was talking to other people persons in my mind that are just a part of me in some way or they're an aspect of me in some way when you dream you're kind of talking to yourself you're not talking to other people because you're just in your mind so we understand from dreaming that your brain or your mind i would say 
can create multiple persons that you can engage with, that you can talk to. Uh, so again, Moon Knight show shows that three persons can be one, but also in our own understanding of mind, we understand that our consciousness can produce multiple persons that you can actually have a conversation with, uh, even though it may not even feel like you're talking to yourself, but in some sense you kind of are, because that's what happens in dreams, doesn't it? You're not talking to other people unless you get possessed. So with that being said, could God, like I, I know we believe that God has been three persons for all eternity, but if he chose to, could he become four persons? Is that a possibility? I think if God chose from eternity, he could. I think three is enough to be a community. So you have, I think it's enough to represent true love. So, you know, you have love is not like Richard Swinburne talks about this. Love is not just between two people. Love spills over into a third and like a family. To have true communal love, you need at least three. And I think that's all that is needed. We don't need more persons of God. Sure, he could be a million persons if he wanted to, but it's not necessary. I think three is the minimal amount that we need to get a community. So that's why I don't think God goes beyond that. I think you're going to have to rewind there. Are you saying God chose to be three persons? That just wasn't his state of nature? Well, I would say that it's an aspect of who he is, sort of like sort of sense. So it sort of just flows from his nature. Um, and again, his choices are going to come from his nature. It's not going to be, they're not going to be divorced in that kind of sense. Like he's going to make an arbitrary choice or something like that. It's going to be something that comes from his nature. And I'm just using choice because again, we're to help explain what I'm getting at here. Yeah. I mean, obviously God doesn't actually, who's, who's a timeless being goes from a state of not choosing to choosing. I'm just sort of using this, these terms to help sort of explain how it would act. Yeah. I think, I think it'd be fruitless for us to try to understand God's mind. We'd be here all day and just kind of get lost. And we will, we will be spending eternity trying to understand God's mind. Yeah. So you try I, to wrap your head around that. I would get yeah. sick by the end of the conversation. So <laughs> this is a very um, complex thing, right? Like if we have to jump outside of the classical logic, why not hold to a viewpoint like modalism or or any of these other things that the church has called a heresy? And I think there's a few of them that people hold to that the church didn't even call a heresy. Why, why not just hold to that? It's It seems simpler. Well, because you said it, it's heresy. This is not what scripture teaches. Scripture clearly teaches uh, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God. Uh, we cannot get away from that. That is just simply a fact of scripture. This is why all the early church fathers from, you know, Ignatius, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, they all taught Trinitarianism. Origen taught a subordinate form, but, you know, we don't have to talk about him. Uh, but yeah, there's just no way to get around this. This is just what the church taught is because this is what scripture taught. And we need to recognize that. Well, there's a there's like a big group of people coming out saying, uh, even like in the scholarly realm, we might be changing topics a little bit here. So if, if you don't want to jump into it, we don't have to. But they're saying that Jesus never claimed to be God. That's that's not even a thing. So what, what would be your, like your quickest way to refute that one? All right. Well, then I, give me a second. I'll pull up a slide here because I actually wrote some notes down here. Uh, yeah, that's just nonsense. Jesus claimed. I mean, just read the Gospel of John over and over again. Jesus is clearly claiming to be God and to deny that is just absurd nonsense. Uh, so here, I'll just give you a quote here uh, that I like to use. I just read in a recent book. So it's, the book is the historical Jesus in the temple by Michael Patrick Barber. Now, if you go to places like Matthew seven, Jesus says, not everyone who comes to me and says, Lord, Lord will inherit the kingdom of heaven. And we go, okay, whatever. Well, Jesus just said he's God there. So Michael Patrick Barber says the double, uh, the, the double um, expression, Lord, Lord, is applied to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21. As Jason Staples has shown, this expression always represents an allusion to, to Tetragrammaton in the Septuagint. In places where the Hebrew has Adonai Yahweh, the Septuagint has Lord, Lord. So a Jew in the Second Temple period is not going to be calling themselves Lord, Lord, because that's literally to say that you are the God of the Bible. Uh, he, Patrick Barber also says this, a scene in Matthew 14 stands out. Jesus exercises a unique prerogative of, of, of God, namely walking on water. Other aspects of the story also suggest Jesus is being placed in the position usually assumed by Yahweh. Jesus is the subject of a cry for salvation. He extends a saving hand, and he stills the storm, keeping in mind uh, the preceding point that Lord, Lord evokes the divine name in the Septuagint, and that is applied to Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Peter's use of Lord in Matthew 14 is not insignificant. Its use here is, is suggestive of the Greek version of Psalm 69, 
a psalm that many have detected in Matthew's passion narrative. And so he goes through and shows that Matthew 14 is really just uh, echoing constantly Psalm 68 from the Septuagint. And just it's borrowing language and vocabulary and saying, which is a psalm clearly about God. And Matthew's saying, no, 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 this is about Jesus when he walked on water kind mm -hmm. of that thing. Uh, you know, so over and over again, Jesus is clearly identified as Yahweh. It, the Father's also identified as Yahweh. The Spirit is also identified as Yahweh, like in Acts, for example. Uh, it's just, it's undeniable. There are three persons that are all God, but there's only one God. This is why we saw Tertullian, for example, come up with the term Trinity to explain this. Why we saw Clement of Alexandria use the same type of language and use the term Trinity to explain this. Same with like, for example, like um, um, Theodosius, for example, clearly taught this. I mean, the Odes of Solomon clearly teaches this. It's very clearly presented in the early church. Okay. And so kind of more on like um, your, your theology, would you say that somebody has to like have knowledge of the Trinity and believe in that uh, to, I, I wouldn't say be saved, right? Because I don't like saying that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say more along the lines of like, be in that communion with Christ. If you want to call yourself a Christian, you have to believe in the Trinity. No ifs, ands, or buts. Mormons are not Christians. Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. Unitarians are not Christians. If you deny the Trinity, that is heresy. You're out. No, no exceptions. This is why I would say Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox are Christian. Why? Because except the Trinity. Uh, deny that. No, you're not a Christian. Now, what about ignorance towards that? Ignorance is a different story. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, go to places like John uh, 9, 41 or John 15, 22, where Jesus said, because I have come, they are guilt. Uh, now, because I have come and now they know they are guilty and they have no excuse. If I had not come, they would not be guilty. So that, that's a different story. I don't think ignorance is necessarily that big of an issue. But if you are made aware of this and you still deny the Trinity, you're outside of the body of Christ. And do you think uh, Second Temple Judaism had a concept of the Trinity or you think this is something that came later? Well, we do see, for example, in Philo, him talking about uh, God working uh, to create creation through his spirit and his word. And he identified them as other persons. Now, he was not a Trinitarian. He looked at these as like other created type entities. But mm -hmm. we do see uh, aspects of this throughout, uh, for example, uh, Second Temple Jewish thought, the idea of like, well, how is... Yahweh up, you know, in heaven, but also on earth. Uh, and so the scholar Benjamin Sama wrote a book called The Bodies of God. And basically in the end, he says, well, I got no real objections to Trinitarian theology because I see a multipersonal God throughout the Hebrew Bible. How can I then be, have a problem with the Trinity if there's a multipersonal God throughout uh, the Hebrew Bible? And so you can also check out the book, The Two Powers in Heaven. Yeah, another Jewish, yeah, another yeah. Jewish theologian making the same point. Right. Um, so what... Uh constantly here with Muslims is like, cause you mentioned the book acts showing that the Holy spirit is God, but Muslims will be like, we can't trust these books. Uh, we can only trust the old Testament for some reason. Uh, obviously they're going to pick the things that agree with them. Would you say that there's a strong case for the, the Holy spirit being God in the old Testament? Or if you have that off the top of your head by chance. Say that again. Sorry, I kind of broke up. It might have been me, but you broke up there a little bit. Say that again. Yeah. So in the Old Testament, would you say there's a strong case for the Holy Spirit being God there? Can we see that? Do we do we have an argument there? Or is it strictly only going into the New Testament? We could see that with the book of Acts. No, I think you can, again, go back to Benjamin Somers. It's this idea that, that God's Spirit is being sent by him, but is also still God. Same with the word that God sends or the the uh, angel, This this uh, for example. But I'd say is a pre-incarnate pre uh, manifestation of Christ. Um, it's this idea that there's we see the aspects in the Old Testament of God sending out this angel. An angel, again, it's not referring to a what we mean by angel. It just means messenger mm -hmm. uh, in the Old Testament. So it can refer to a human messenger or, an, or a divine messenger. But there's constantly this idea of this messenger of Yahweh showing up who says he's God. That This is who appears to Moses in the burning bush. It says the messenger of Yahweh showed up and then claims to be God. Same with the spirit. We see the spirit being sent out and is also claiming to be God. Uh, you know, Justin Martyr actually talks about this a lot in his dialogue with Trifo. Uh, focuses more on Christ, uh, but he does make uh, make references to that in the, and in the first apology to the prophetic spirit that is also God. Uh, and so we, we definitely see these kind of acts, aspects throughout the Old Testament. And this is why Benjamin Somers says that God does appear to be multipersonal. There's like extensions of him uh, that come out and are distinct from God, but are still God. Okay. 
Um, in all honesty, man, I think you kind of nailed all my questions. So I, it's a short live, but that's all I really got for you. Do you have any more you want to well, add? Well, here, I want to I want to add something else here. So people get mad at Trinity. Like, why would God uh, reveal this? Isn't it going to make things confusing and hard for us? Let me quote from Edward Grant in his book, The Foundations of Modern Science, because sometimes complexity or puzzles, things that we don't fully understand, lead to better things as we try to solve them or understand mm. them better. He says this, he says, certain aspects of their religion, that is Christianity, may also, may also have drawn Christians to Greek philosophy. One example is the problem of the Eucharist with its difficulties about the nature of substances and their attributes. Adoption of a Trinitarian position placed enormous metaphysical burdens on Christianity. Once Jesus was perceived as the son of God, the problems of expounding the nature of the Godhead were formidable indeed. To help explain such theological difficulties, scholars deem the, co scholars deem the concepts and terminology of Greek metaphysics essential. Logic was also considered important. St. Augustine regularly used logic to resolve theological problems and thus made a model for later theologians. Uh, strictly Unitarian religions such as Islam and Judaism needed no such metaphysical assistance or apparatus to expand the nature of God. Although there was, of course, problems that seemed to be to require some sort of uh, philosophical explication. So what he goes on to basically note is that Christians try to wrestle with the Eucharist and mm -hmm. Trinitarian theology. Uh, actually had to dive deep into Greek philo philosophy. And they came up with all sorts of new terms that actually spilled over into natural philosophy. And again, his book is The Foundations of Modern Science in the Middle Ages. His point is basically that as Christians were trying to work through their theology, they inadvertently spurred modern science. They, they, the, their understanding of concepts, their terms, helped grow science in ways that we, did, we could not have seen back then. So... In some sense, God revealing aspects of his nature that can be kind of confusing to us actually helped science develop that we would not have suspected that. So making everything so super simple for us may not be the best thing. Maybe God does need to give us a little bit of complexity, reveal aspects of his nature that are not going to be so intuitive to us to actually help us in ways. And it does appear that Trinitarian theology did play a role in leading to developments in science. Bro, you just blew my mind. That's wild. So to kind of shorten that up, you're saying God made himself complex so that we study him harder and Ooh. get smarter. Not made himself. What? Sorry, he revealed <laughs> himself. Sorry, let me correct my, my – he revealed himself in a, in a complex way. So we study him study him, and then we like work in our process of sanctification, quote unquote, and we kind of spring forth this, this new and better world. I would say God was three persons by, uh, from eternity. It's not something that he did for us. He yeah. just simply is three. Per he allowed us to have that knowledge because he knew that us trying to wrestle with this would lead to and help the development of science. And it did. Uh, this is what Edward Grant basically notes. So, you know, maybe everything being so simple and tight packed and not having any issues to wrestle with is not so much a good thing. Maybe uh, actually having a little complexity and a little bit of puzzles that don't just fit with our intuition are good in some ways. And we can see this is one aspect. Yeah. Amen, man. Uh, so if you got a few more minutes, we'll kind of open it up for chat. Are you good with that? For some yeah, questions, let's go some for Q and A. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I saw a question earlier. I did want to address um, um, on monarchical Trinitarianism. Um, if I can find it, I will, I will address that one. The one I want to bring up right now is uh, debunk the three in one shampoo, please. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> Again, God is on a physical substance. We, you know, it's not like that. That's just partialism. Uh, it, it was just heresy. God, is, there's not three parts of God that you take one part away, like you take the Holy Spirit away, and now God is not complete. That's just no. Each there is one God. God is three persons. Each person is fully God. Uh, so you know, if you have a three-in-one shampoo, the conditioner is not fully the the mixture you got there it's just a part of it so that's just partialism this is why we need to stop comparing god to shampoo uh physical things you got, <laughs> compare god to a mind you know is there a metaphor you like like if you're if you're like i know moon you night. like the moon, moon night but like fire do you like the fire one you have you heard that uh, one yeah justin martyr use that one that one's okay it's probably going to be the best you're going to get to it but again god is a mind compared to other minds you can compare them again to as i mentioned um you could go into the long complex understanding of agency. You can compare them to, uh, make an analogy to Moon Knight and compare them to, again, you talking with another uh, aspect of you in a dream, you know, another person that you have fully manifested somehow, uh, that kind of thing. It's still in your consciousness, but it's not you and it's another person, that kind of thing. There's another analogy. Those are the ones I would use. 
Uh, Choose Unique says, uh, can you do a stream of Sam Shamoon on the Quran's view of the Bible in response to a Muslim TikToker? I think Christians would gain a lot more info for that. Do you, do you have Sam Shamoon on your your texting texting platform? I don't have his number, but I mean, if he wanted to, I'd be I'd be honored to do that. I don't I don't I don't know if he'd want to do that with me, but it, I'd be OK doing it with him. Um, I did find a question I want to address. The, uh, someone said earlier, Timothy said the problem with monarchical Trinitarianism is that you would say the Son and the Spirit lack something which would make the Son and the Spirit not God. Now, this is not true. As Joshua Sijawati notes, they share all intrinsic properties. So they share all they share all omniscience, omnipresence, omnibenevolence, uh, omnipotence. What the Father has is that the Son and the Spirit don't have is an extrinsic property. That is a saity. Which is that he is um, he doesn't nothing generates the uh, the father he you know he generates the spirit and begets, begets the son so that they he generates I guess we could say in a simple sense he generates the spirit and the son but he doesn't generate so nothing generates him so the son and the spirit um, uh, have their foundation in the father the father is just a say he's the only being that has a saity but that's an extrinsic property because you can only define it in relation to other things it's not an intrinsic property. So this father, son, and the spirit share all intrinsic properties. The father just has a, the extrinsic property of a saity. Therefore, Trinitarianism is saved. It does, you don't have to uh, take a subordinate understanding of this. Okay. This is um, kind of a weird question, but it, it leads into a question I would ask. It says, IP, would you do a debate video on the 66 book canons versus 73 book canon? I've been studying no. history. You, you wouldn't do a no, debate on I'm, that? I don't I don't want to get into those disputes. Um, I, I don't think that they're that important. Uh, I, I just prefer to, um, uh, I, I, there's only certain disputes, internal disputes I get in like young earth creationism, birth, atheistic evolution, because that's a big problem for a lot of Christians. And I found it very helpful for me to address that and bringing more people into the kingdom. But some of these other things, I just don't think they're, they're necessary. I'm more interested in bringing people into the kingdom and getting into these type of arguments. Yeah. You're not too interested in the, uh, eternal debate between like denominations and like creating more division. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think that I think that's awesome. Um, this comes from Abenezer says, would you define omniscience as knowledge of all true propositions or would you give a different definition? No, that's the definition I gave in my video on the omniscience paradox debunked. All right. And then eternal generation was originally a Gnostic view and he refuted it. Who? No, no. I mean, Gnostics got a lot of their stuff from Christianity and um, Greek philosophy. Uh they borrowed a lot from Christianity, so I would say, if anything, that they, depending on what he's talking about, uh, know that they would have got it from the Christians. Okay, and uh, yeah, I think I think that's good, man. I, I appreciate your time, and I appreciate you coming on and solving that, because like I said, um, I was left confused. Uh, friends mm -hmm. of mine were left confused, and we were all kind of chatting, um, so I hope you know, people on TikTok. I hope you guys can watch this. I hope this kind of explains it and brings that out yeah. a little bit and more. To, um, Respond to the comment, Michael Media. Just you got to go back and watch the full stream because we answer that full question in the stream. Like so, that's what the whole stream is about. So just go back to the beginning; it'll cover everything. I give analogies to help explain this. Yeah, people don't like to go back and actually do any work. <laughs> I'm not going to re-explain everything. <laughs> All right. Um, all right, guys. Thank you so much for hanging out live and being a part of this. If you liked it, uh, please make sure that you drop a like, you hit the subscribe button, that you head over to uh, Inspiring Philosophy's channel, that you follow him, you like and comment on his, all his videos as well. They're a wealth of knowledge. Um, I, you know, I've been taking a lot from it, and it's been, a, you know, it's been a great help, man. I think your ministry is great, and uh, yeah. I appreciate you all guys. If you want to support on all platforms, all links are down below. You can support me on Patreon, of course, as well. Support Inspiring Philosophy on Patreon. Uh, God bless and have yourselves a great day.